Hello, I'm John Molesky, and this is Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Today, we're going to be talking about a recent report issued by the center. It's called Of Swans and Rhinos, Building Resilience in the Semiconductor Supply Chain. And our guests are the co-authors of the report. Please welcome to the program, Duncan Wood and Alexandra Helfgott. Duncan, Alexandra, thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. So, uh, let's start off with a really basic question, Alexandra. I'll begin with you uh, about the the purpose of the study. What did you set out to learn? Supply chain issues have always been present in our lives, but they really came to the forefront, especially for the average consumer with the pandemic. And it's not to say that the pandemic caused all of these supply chain issues, especially with the semiconductor supply chain, but that's when the issues really came to the forefront particularly for average consumers. And so the Wilson Center wanted to provide um, a complementary perspective to the work that was being done by other think tanks by the Biden administration, who did the 100-day review, the one-year review of America's supply chains with specific focus on the semiconductor supply chain. We wanted to provide a complementary view with a focus on the long-term over-the-horizon challenges facing the semiconductor supply chain. And so that's what that's what this report is. That's the These are the conclusions that we found from from the work that we did with our working group, which consisted of members of government, academia, and, and then also the... Um... Thanks, thanks. Duncan, uh, you have become our man when it comes to uh, supply chains. Uh, th this is a really interesting work that you've spearheaded here at the center. Let me ask you about the inspiration for the name, the use of the metaphors of the black swan and the, the, the gray rhino. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, um, the pandemic, uh, is a classic example of a of a black swan event, something that has a huge impact throughout the system. Um, and yet most people, in fact, almost everybody failed to recognize that it was coming. So this was an unexpected, an un unexpected event with massive consequences. Um, we could look at other kinds of uh, black swan events. We could look at the outbreak of uh, of conflict in uh, in Ukraine this year. We could look at the um, the financial uh, crash that took place in uh, in 2008, 2009, the Great Recession, which came after that. And these are, are events, as I say, that have an enormous impact upon the system in general. Um, and we recognize that, uh, you know, obviously the pandemic had been one of those, but it was unlikely to be the last black swan event that we would see in our lifetime that would impact the semiconductor sector. And because we were looking at this kind of animal metaphor, we found another very useful one, the gray rhino. And the gray rhino, is uh, a kind of a funny idea. Um, the, the concept is this, if you see a rhino on the horizon and it's looking at you and you realize that it may be about to charge at you, it's a long way away. And so you say, actually, you know what? I know it's coming for me, but I've got time to get out of the way. And through a combination of perverse incentives, it results that you don't get out of the way. The rhino charges you end up getting gored. And the best example of that, of course, is climate change. We've seen climate change coming for decades. We know we need to do something about it, but we haven't done enough to get out of the way of that particular charging rhino. Now, why do we want to use these two metaphors? Well, um, a lot of the work that's been done on supply chains uh, since the pandemic by the US government and by the private sector and other think tanks has focused on the immediate challenges of getting semiconductors to the end users, for example, to the automobile uh, industry. And what we decided to do was to say, what are the over the horizon challenges that we need to be aware of? So things that we are not necessarily focusing on right now, but we know are gonna be problems in the future. We, in the case of a, a black swan, we don't know necessarily what it's going to be, but uh, in the case of a gray rhino, we can say, we know that there are problems coming down the pipe. And essentially what we were trying to do here was to identify those, um, those challenges that may be over the horizon and to suggest ways in which industry, government and society should prepare themselves for those challenges. And, and, and as, as you, you unpeeled the onion and looked at this, how much did you discover that these were problems that could have been anticipated, that they weren't just the effect of the pandemic, that there were weaknesses in the, in the process beforehand, or how much of it was actually just the bad luck of a global pandemic? Is there a way to parse that? Can we sort of, you know, percentage wise, how much of this was bad planning, short term thinking versus an, a, a, an act of God? Um, so listen, it, it, it's very difficult to put a percentage on it. But what we do know is that this is not the first time that we have seen 
um, uh, problems in terms of supplying either enough semiconductors to, uh, to industry or where there has been oversupply and therefore there have been massive losses in the semiconductor industry. And of course, the, the pandemic itself, although we refer to it as a black swan event, it wasn't really a black swan event. We knew that there was going to be a, a pandemic of some kind at some point because we've had them in the past. And this brings us to the most important point, I would say, about the, uh, the publication, which is that what we need to do is to build more resilient supply chains. We can't predict every event that's going to come over the horizon. What we can do, though, is to build resilient supply chains. That means supply chains that have more diverse sources of semiconductors and the materials that they need. We know that we need to uh, build uh, uh, infrastructure for, for industry. We know we need to invest in human capital. We know we need to think about things like water and energy. And if we do all those things, we're going to be much better prepared to face whatever challenges happen in the years to come. Alexandra, in many cases, it's human nature, right, that when things are working well, we take them for granted. And suddenly the pandemic emerges and we see uh, shortages of products that were on the shelves before that we never thought of, or in the case of something like semiconductors, uh, it wasn't even on the supermarket shelves, but we just assumed it all worked. Uh, what is the importance of semiconductors in the global economy? And, and what did the pandemic reveal about this? Semiconductors are a tiny, tiny piece of technology, but they absolutely run our worlds. From the computers that we're using right now to conduct this interview, to the headphones, to the coffee machine that we use to brew our coffee, the air conditioning, I mean, everything that runs on electricity practically uses semiconductors. And so I, I have the impression that prior to the pandemic, the average consumer didn't really understand the, the significant implications of semiconductors. It wasn't until that they, they went to the store to purchase something or they tried to order a car online that they realize, wow, these little pieces of technology really do run our worlds. And if we don't have sufficient supply, there's gonna be a problem. Just to make a clear example, if a car company produces a car, everything is ready, but the chip to run the seat heaters or put the windows down isn't there. That one chip for a minor thing like a seat heater, that completely delays the final production and eventual sale of, of the cars. And so you can imagine it's not just one car, it's whole fleets of cars across companies across the world. Um, and that's just one example. It happened with appliances, it happened with uh, defense devices, things like that. So really, we saw a wide range impact of, of the lack of semiconductors. We, When times are good in the semiconductor industry, the global division of labor is excellent and the benefits are absolutely apparent. But when something happens like a flood or a fire in a glue factory in Taiwan or something like the pandemic, we see that there really are negative consequences associated with this you know, lack of division of labor. Um, and we've really, as a society, as consumers and also manufacturers have become super, super dependent on semiconductors and the specialized production. And one point that I just want to highlight here that I found fascinating from the working group is that the semiconductor supply chain is cyclical, like Duncan was saying. So in 2000, with the internet bubble, the financial crisis in 2008, the pandemic in 2020, those are all examples when we had this six-part cycle of the semiconductors, you know, the so first, new fabs are built to increase production, the capacity happens. Then as a result, prices drop, demand increases as a result of the price drop, then capacity becomes limited, and then the price increases again. A very simple cycle. We've seen it numerous times, and it's just important to note that this is not unprecedented. We need to be doing things to prepare um, and foster resilience because we know that this is a pattern. Thanks. So Duncan, when we should we think of this as fixing or improving? Um, you know, I don't think you're ever going to eliminate problems. So it's improving. Um, it's about making the system work better, but it's also about making the system work differently, John. Uh -huh. uh, at this point in time, we're so highly dependent upon a small number of uh, specialized uh, sources for semiconductors, particularly the high end semiconductors that we need to diversify. We need to bring some of that production back here to the United States. We need to make sure that our European allies, for example, are, uh, are investing in their semiconductor industry, because the last thing that we want is for either another pandemic or a geopolitical problem, the outbreak of conflict, for example, or a strike somewhere to actually impact upon our, our supply of, of semiconductors. 
And ultimately, I think this ties in so neatly with everything that we're seeing in the evolution of supply chain thinking in general, which is that we're beginning to think about uh, how we secure access to the goods that we need and we want. How do we do that in a much more integrated or integral way where we take into consideration not just the factor of price, but the factors of national security, geopolitics, environment, social governance, etc. And of course, we've seen a lot of that happening, John, over the past couple of months. We've seen um, you know, the, uh, the Chips and Science Act go through Congress. We've seen export controls on technology um, to China. And we're seeing this turning very much into a question of strategic competition um, between the United States, Europe on one side, and China on the other. About that, this this is a classic uh, public-private partnership dilemma, right? It's It can't be done by one or the other. Uh, so is the level of cooperation between governments and private industry where it needs to be to address these challenges? I think we, we're seeing unprecedented cooperation at this point in time. Is it where it needs to be? Um, I think it can always be improved. What we are seeing is we're seeing substantial pushback from the part of the uh, the private sector against uh, legislation that has gone through the US Congress, against some of the export controls, and recognizing that uh, there are spillover effects that are not necessarily positive from some of these efforts that, that have been uh, made by the US government. And so we're in very much a, a dynamic relationship between the private sector, the US government, but also between the US government and its allies in Europe and Asia, who are saying that they're actually being um, uh, negatively impacted by some of these, uh, these efforts by the US. And so I expect this to be a, a situation which, which will evolve over time. Uh, we're gonna see changes in legislation. We'll see changes in the implementation of that legislation. And I expect we'll see a lot more efforts at coordination and cooperation at the international level. So uh, let me ask both of you to put your heads together on, on these uh, next steps and key recommendations that the report includes. And in the context of what Duncan just talked about, that there has been action since the report was issued. And so some things are happening. And Alexandria, let's begin with you. What are, what are your thoughts on, on that question? And then Duncan, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. My biggest takeaway would be we are not trying, the semiconductor industry is not should not strive to eliminate risk in the supply chain, but rather foster capacity to react and pivot and bounce back if the risk becomes reality. There's no way that we can entirely eliminate risk, but there needs to be methods and policies in place to foster resiliency. And the foundation of that is diversifying the geographic footprint of the global, global semiconductor supply chain. It's too risky to have such geographic concentration like we have currently, whether that's nearshoring, ally shoring, Something needs to be done. And the answer is not to bring everything to the United States. No, that's a continuation of, of the existing issues. But we really need to have creative solutions, have government investment. Great that we have the CHIPS Act, but we really need sustained and continued investment. And then finally, I also want to touch on the element of human capital. It's great if we have all of these fabs. It's great if we have all this financial investment. But if you don't have people to run the machines, to do the manufacturing, to do the packaging, you know, we're going to have another issue. So really being wise with the financial investment, not just in the logistical infrastructure, but then also looking at the human capital part of the picture. Thanks, Duncan. Yeah, I guess my big takeaway from all of this, and it came out of the process of writing the report, is that while we were writing the report, the uh, Chips and Science Act went through Congress, which meant that we had to change our report. Um, and that wasn't a bad thing because actually this made it, uh, gave it a, a lot, much longer shelf life. And of course, since the publication of the, uh, of the report, um, between the publication of the report and the, the making of this video, we've seen the implementation of, uh, of export controls. This is a highly dynamic situation. Things are going to be changing. And the point that we made in the report was that you've never, you're, you're never going to reach that one and done situation. There's no silver bullet. This is something to which we have to pay ongoing attention. It is a priority. It has massive consequences for our geoeconomic, geopolitical competitiveness. And so this is something which we want to maintain a, uh, a focus on at the Wilson Center and try to impact and, and uh, affect in a positive way the policy process in the United States and around the world on this issue. 
in part of the process of doing that is discussions like the one we're having now. But also, I want to ask you to plug an event that by the time people see this edition of Wilson Center now, the way they'll find this on the Wilson Center website is on the, the past events tab. Uh, time travel is a weird thing. But you have an event coming up, Outlooks for Strategic Competition in the Semiconductor Industry. Uh, tell our viewers about that, Duncan. Who are the players who will be at the, uh, part of that discussion? Yeah, we're delighted to uh, to be able to host a, a, a truly high-level expert panel. Um, we have got uh, a member of our Wilson Center Global Advisory Council, Don McClellan, who will be moderating a conversation. Uh, Alexandra and myself, as, as co-authors of that of the report, will be there. We also have Cordell, a former um, Trump administration official who has worked uh, for a long time now on questions of strategic competition, particularly in the tech sector between China and the United States. We've got Kelly Wicker, who is the director of our science, technology and innovation program, who will be on the panel as well, uh, talking about uh, you know, how technology advances and how that's going to impact this, uh, this equation. And of course, we've got uh, uh, Jimmy Goodrich, who uh, is of the uh, Semiconductor Industry Association, um, a great industry expert who will be presenting to us you know, what the private sector thinks of about uh, uh, the, the moves that have taken place recently and where we go from here. That kind of you know, nuanced, um, multi-dimensional conversation, exactly the kind of thing that I think we need to have at this point in time. You know, policymakers, um, we've got academics, we've got, uh, uh, you know, think tankers, and we've got industry representatives. Those kind of conversations tend to be high, uh, to, tend to be very rich, I think, in, in terms of the content. Thank you. Great stuff. Interesting and informative and, and critical, as you say. Uh, Alexandra Duncan, congratulations on the report. Thanks for joining us, us today. And I should also tell our viewers, in addition to that event that Duncan just described, which you can find at wilsoncenter.org, you can find the report that we were just talking about today, Swans and Rhinos, Building Resilience in the Semiconductor Supply Chain, available to you free of charge. You can download a PDF. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center. I'm John Molesky. Thanks for your time and interest.